unconscionability of premarital agreements. That's the subject of today's ACTEC Trust and Estate Talk. Welcome to ACTEC Trust and Estate Talk from the American College of Trust and Estate Counsel, a professional society of peer-elected trust and estate lawyers in the United States and around the globe. This series offers professionals best practice advice, insights, and commentary on subjects that affect our profession and clients. And now, our ACTEC fellow host with today's topic. This is Lois Ann Stanton, ACTEC fellow from Austin, Texas. Estate planning sometimes requires the creation and execution of premarital or postmarital agreements. Last week, in Part 1, ACTEC fellow Rich Garini from San Jose, California, shared a review of the statutory framework governing marital agreements. This week, in Part 2, he will explore some actual cases involving disputes based on unconscionability. Welcome, Rich. Thank you, Lois Ann. So, in terms of giving you some examples of how the courts will uh, find unconscionability uh, such that they will not enforce a premarital agreement, I think it's helpful to look at some of the cases. And I'm first going to talk to you about some California cases, and then I'm going to expand that and talk about cases from New York, uh, Virginia, and Hawaii. So uh, the first case that I want to talk about is in Ray Marriage of Factor. Factor is spelled F as in Frank, A-C as in Charles, T as in Tom, E-R. 2013, 212 Calap 4th, 967. That's 212 Calap 4th, 967. The story of Jeff and Nancy. The spouses entered into a premarital agreement in 1994. Husband is an attorney, and the court obviously was making a particular point of the fact that he was a graduate of Harvard Law School and a partner in a uh, firm uh, practicing securities and corporate governance litigation. Uh, He had disclosed at the very beginning a separate property of about $3 million, annual earnings of four seventy-five to 700000 in the prior five years per year. Wife, on the other hand, was selling shoes part-time at Nordstrom's. So you can see where this is going. So she testifies that she didn't like that job. She wanted to become a real estate agent. Husband uh, financed that. And then when they got married, she decided she didn't want to be a real estate agent. So she stopped working. She was going through a divorce at that point in time. So she wasn't exactly as innocent as she might have portrayed herself to to, to be. In fact, she knew much more about the divorce process than her husband had. Anyway, the premarital agreement provided that the husband would retain all of his income, all of of the assets as his separate property. Wife would receive $100,000 plus an additional $100,000 if the marriage lasted at least 15 years. And he was a partner at his law firm for at least seven years. Half of the equity of the residence, less his down payments, which were substantial, and any expenses and fees and taxes that were incurred with that sale. And she also got a Jaguar automobile. So the fact that the agreement predated the statutes that I referred to in the first podcast, the court, in any event, they said that they were not precluded from examining the unconscionability at the time of execution and at the time of enforcement. And so the court went through a fairly detailed analysis of the existing law, referring back also to a Supreme Court case in California called Marriage of Pendleton, which came down exactly on the same date as the Marriage of Bonds case. And in Pendleton, the wife uh, was found to have a master's degree She was an aspiring writer. She and her spouse had approximately net worths that were equal at about $2.5 million. Each of them had been represented by independent counsel. And she was asking for spousal support in spite of a waiver uh, of that support in their premarital agreement. And the court said, quote, it is enough to conclude here that no public policy is violated by permitting enforcement of a waiver of spousal support executed by intelligent, well-educated persons, 
each of whom appears to be self-sufficient in property and earning ability, and both of whom have the advice of counsel regarding their rights and obligations as marital partners at the time they execute the waiver. Such a waiver does not violate public policy and is not per se unenforceable. In Factor, on the other hand, the court found that the wife was not a well-educated person. She was not self-sufficient in property and earning capacity at the time she signed the agreement. She was, in fact, a recently unemployed high school graduate with two minor children selling shoes at Nordstrom's, living rent-free in the home that the husband financed for them. At the time of the divorce, the the, the husband was earning about $500,000 a year and had uh, $3 million of separate property, including a home in Tiburon, which uh, for those who are not familiar with that area is pretty high rent land. Wife had no property of her own. So the court makes a note of the great disparity in the party's respective incomes and assets at the time they entered the uh, agreement. And they also suggest that this is indicative of a significant inequality of bargaining power. So because of that, at the time of the divorce, the husband now has separate property in excess of $10 million, earning a $1 million per year, whereas the wife has no separate property of her own and no income. The court found that agreement to be unconscionable. Next case was in Ray Marriage of Zucker, uh, a 2022 uh, California appellate case, and that's Zucker, Z-U-C-K-E-R, 75 Calap 5th to 1025. That's 75 Calap 5th. 1025. There we have a husband who is a co-founder and CEO of a hedge fund and a bond broker. Had net worth at that time of about 10 million, was making 2 million dollars per year. So you see folks were in the wrong business here. Wife had a history of psychological troubles including anorexia. She graduated from high school, took a few classes at college but never graduated and uh, she had admitted herself into a psychiatric hospital for uh, anorexia, uh, and then because of a kind of a low-level crime, she was transferred to a lock ward where she was raped at knife point. She was first married, but uh, that marriage was dissolved. She met husband number two, uh, in this case, Mark Zucker, uh, in 1993. He was 33, she was 29. She got pregnant in 1993 and at her second husband's request had an abortion. She became pregnant again late that year. And even though the husband asked her to get another abortion, she refused. So in January of 1994, the parties signed a premarital agreement that waived the wife's community property interest, gave her a one-time payment of 10000 upon moving out of the house, which husband number two had the right to enforce, and limited her spousal support to 6000 per month with modest increases, and also waived her inheritance rights. At that time, she disclosed her assets at about 242000 Husband had assets of about $5.8 million. During the marriage, she bears him six children. Now, if I'm the judge right there, she wins the case. But and wife's attorney advised her not to sign the premarital agreement. So despite the court, the trial court and the appellate court finding that the wife had voluntarily executed the premarital agreement and that there was no duress or undue influence, the court found that the disparity in the party's income, husband had at that point in time, at the time of the divorce, $32 million in net worth, four to $5 million of yearly income, while the wife stayed at home and raised those six children, had no current employment, and that she would need between thirty-seven and $86,000 per month to meet the marital lifestyle. Both the trial court and the appellate court found that the spousal support provisions were unconscionable and unenforceable. Some other cases are similar in that regard. From New York, Gardella versus Remizov, R-E-M-I-Z-O-V. Uh, That's 144 A.D. 3rd, 977, from 2016. 144 A.D. 3rd, 977. Parties married in 2000. They entered into a couple of postnuptial agreements. Wife was a neurologist and had a medical practice, and the premarital agreements basically allowed for all of those assets to be her separate property. They also signed a separation agreement in 2010. At the time, she was earning $600,000 a year. 
husband was a wine salesman, earning about $40,000 a year. So you see, love is not only blind, it's also ignorant about economics. Uh, The separation agreement provided that the husband would have no interest in any of the assets acquired during marriage, and the husband was not represented by counsel when he signed that agreement. The court found that in view of the fiduciary relationship between the spouses, separation agreements are more closely scrutinized than ordinary contracts. And so what uh, the, the court said was that uh, even though the postnuptial agreements were executed voluntarily and were enforceable, the separation agreement gave rise to issues that required the court to remand it for determination as to whether it was unconscionable. Sims versus Sims, uh, 2009 Virginia case, 55 VA uh, app uh, 340. That's 55 VA app 340. The spouses uh, married in 68 and separated in 2006. Initially, husband offered wife to give her 2000 per month until she received half of everything. Wife refused to sign that agreement because it didn't include husband's retirement and deferred compensation. Thereafter, wife started talking to people, including her son and the husband's attorney, that she didn't want anything from the marriage. She just wanted to have a divorce. Well, as you might imagine, husband's attorney and husband thought that they had died and went to heaven. So husband's attorney drafted an agreement that waived everything on behalf of the wife. The only thing she receives was a 1999 pickup truck and some tangible personal property. She ultimately, and of course at that point in time, husband had substantial assets. Wife thereafter does hire an attorney, and that attorney uh, uh, files an action to invalidate the agreement based upon unconscionability. And the court finds that uh, because of her disability regarding depression, high blood pressure, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, etc., that she was unable to understand what she was finding. Also, they point out she had a, quote, a third grade education, was married at age 16, and had been married for 38 years during which time she didn't really have any ability to take care of herself. So the court finds that that agreement was unconscionable. And similarly, uh, they, they make a distinction between that case and a prior Virginia case called Galloway versus Galloway, uh, where the wife had been a nurse's aide for 20 years, had been working with the husband in his heating and air conditioning business, during which time she had worked as an installer, and the fact that she'd also received an inheritance from her family. So the court said, based upon that, nothing in the record suggests that the wife is incapable of enjoying financial independence. There is also a case in Hawaii, Lewis v. Lewis, that's L-E-W-I-S versus L-E-W-I-S, 1988, 69 Hawaii 497, that's 69 HAW 497. And there the courts had found that this agreement, as was in some of the other cases, predated Hawaii's adoption of the Uniform Premarital Agreement Act, but that the court nevertheless had the right to take a look at the circumstances at the time of divorce and found that because of the disparities, that this agreement potentially was uh, unconscionable and remanded the case back to the uh, trial court. So the bottom line to all of these cases, uh, I think I can summarize in three adages. Number one, don't be stingy. Number two, you have to understand, uh, you have to explain to your clients that they've got to pay to, to play. And number three, don't take advantage of your shoe selling spouses or wine selling spouses. From a practical standpoint, when you ask yourself, well, how can I put together a valid premarital agreement? I think that the safest approach is to determine what the normal support would be and maybe use a discounted percentage of that. That may certainly be a lot more than your clients would want to pay, but you've got to explain to them in the form of that CYA letter that anything less could potentially leave them exposed for that agreement being invalidated. Well, thank you, Rich. And that's a great sharing of a sample of the case law where marital agreements were attacked based upon unconscionability. Thank you for listening to this episode of Act Tech Trust and Estate Talk. 
the podcast series about wealth planning matters from the American College of Trust and Estate Counsel. To find an ACTEC lawyer near you, visit ACTEC.org. Please subscribe to this series and leave us a rating or a review. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at ACTEC Talk.